Hi, this is Jason DeCanio once again welcoming you to Jay's Retro Toys and Games for Monday, November 14th, 2022. And this time, well, we had a great successful run with our Matchbox series. And today on episode 35, we're going to be looking at the other car company that's been around since 1968. Scale model cars introduced by the American toy maker Mattel. It was the primary competitor of Matchbox until 1997 when Mattel bought Tyco Toys, then owner of Matchbox. Many automobile manufacturers have since licensed this company to make scale models of their cars, allowing the use of original design, blueprints, and detailing. Although Hot Wheels, well, I just gave it away, were originally intended to be for young children and young adults, they have become popular with adult collectors for whom limited edition models are now made. That's right, we're looking at Hot Wheels today on Jay's Retro Toys and Games. Welcome to this edition of Jay's Retro Toys and Games, episode 35 coming at you. I'm your host, Jason Icanio, and hope you had a great weekend, and we're ready to go for another week of good toys and games, and right now we're looking at Hot Wheels. Yes, Hot Wheels, because <laughs> we can, the competitor to Matchbox. Well, the original Hot Wheels, they were made by Elliot Handler, and Handler discovered his son Kenneth playing with Matchbox cars and decided to create a line to compete with Matchbox. Hot Wheels were originally conceived by Handler to be more like Hot Rod, you know, customized, modified, or even characterized or fantasy cars, often with big rear tires, superchargers, flame paint jobs, outlandish proportions, you know, hood blowers, you know, etc. cars. And as compared to Matchbox cars, which were generally small-scale models of production cars, he began producing the cars with assistance from fellow engineer Jack Ryan. The first line of Hot Wheels cars, known as the original Sweet 16, was manufactured in 1968. These were the first of the Red Line series, named for the tires which had a red pinstripe on their sides. There were 16 castings released, 11 of them designed by Harry Bentley Bradley with assistance from Handler and Ryan. The first one produced was a dark blue custom Camaro, and Bradley was from the car industry and had designed the body for the full-size Dodge Diora concept car and the custom fleet side based on his own customized 1968 Chevrolet C10 fleet side. In addition to the cars themselves, Mattel produced a ra racing track set that was sold separately. Though it would be updated throughout the years, the original track consisted of a series of bright orange road sections pieced together to form an oblong circular racetrack with one or sometimes two superchargers, faux service stations through which cars passed on the tracks, featuring battery-powered spinning wheels which would propel the cars along the tracks. Hot Wheels' use of wide, hard plastic tires created much less friction and tracked more smoothly than the narrow metal or plastic wheels used on contemporary matchboxes. Hot Wheels cars were designed to roll easily and at high speeds, which was a great innovation at the time. Then in 1969, the Hot Wheels brand was a staggering success. The series completely disrupted the industry for small die-cast car models from 68 onwards, forcing the competition at Matchbox and elsewhere to completely rethink their concepts and to scramble to try to recover lost ground. Harry Bentley Bradley did not think that that would be the case and had quit Mattel to go back to the car industry. When the company asked him to come back, he recommended a good friend, Ira Guilford, now, Guilford, who had just left Chrysler, quickly accepted the job of designing the next Hot Wheels models. Some of Hot Wheels' greatest cars, such as the Twin Mill and Split and Image, came from Ira Guilford's drawing board. The Twin Mill was introduced in 1969 and was used to create the company's first full-scale replica, replica car in 2001. 
The success of the 1968 line was solidified and consolidated with the 1969 releases, with which Hot Wheels effectively established itself as the hottest brand of small toy car models in the USA. Split and Image, Torero, Turbo Fire, and Twin Mill were part of the Show and Go series and are the very first original in-house designs by Hot Wheels. The initial prototypes of the Beach Bomb were faithful to the shape of a real VW Type 2 bus and had two surfboards sticking out the back window in a nod to the VW's perceived association with the surfing community and the slang term for a person who spends much time surfing, which is a beach bum. During the fledgling Hot Wheels era, Mattel wanted to make sure that each of the cars could be used with any of the play sets and stunt track sets. Well, unfortunately, testing showed that this early version, now known among collectors as the Rear Loader Beach Bomb, or the RLBB, was too narrow to roll effectively on Hot Wheels track or be powered by the supercharger, and was too top-heavy to negotiate high-speed corners. Hot Wheels designers Howard Rees and Larry Wood modified the casting, extending the side fenders to accommodate the track width, as well as providing a new place on the vehicle to store each of the plastic surfboards. The roof <clears throat> was also cut away and replaced by a full-length sunroof to lower the center of gravity, nicknamed the side loader by collectors. This was the production version of the Beach Bomb. The rear loader beach bomb is widely considered the holy grail or ultimate pinnacle of a series Hot Wheels or a series Hot Wheels collection. An unknown number were made as test subjects and given to employees. A regular production beach bomb may be up to worth $600 depending on condition. Market prices on RLBBs, however, have easily reached the five-figure plateau ranging from $70,000 to $120,000. The Peterson Automotive Museum in Los Angeles had a pink RLBB in its Hot Wheels exhibit displayed alone on a rotating platform under glass. The Hot Wheels Collectors Club released a new updated version of the rear-loading beach bomb in 2002 as a limited edition. 1970 was a very successful year for Hot Wheels, so Mattel came up with a new advertising slogan for the cars. Go with the winner. 43 new cars appeared that year, including the Sizzlers and Heavyweights lines. Howard Rees, who worked with Ira Guilford, was tired of designing cars. He wanted to work on the major Matt Mason action figure toy lineup. So Rees had a good friend by the name of Larry Wood, whom he worked with at Ford Designing Cars. When Wood found out about Hot Wheels at a party Rees was holding, Rees offered him the job of designing Hot Wheels models. Wood accepted, and by the end of the week, Wood was working at Mattel, where he, where his first design was the Tri Baby. Larry Wood retired in 2019 after over 40 years of designing cars. Another designer, Paul Tam, joined Wood and Guilford. Tam's first design was the Whip Creamer. <laughs> Tam continued to work for Mattel until 1973. And among the many fantastic designs Tam thought up for Hot Wheels, some of the collector's favorites included Evil Weevil, which is a Volkswagen Beetle with two engines, the Open Fire, which is an AMC Gremlin with six wheels, the Six Shooter, another six-wheeled car, and the Rare Double Header, co-designed with Larry Wood. The year 1970 introduced the Snake and the Mongoose, a manufactured rivalry between two professional drag racers calling themselves the Snake and the Mongoose for the purposes of publicity. This was notably drag racing's first major non-automotive co corporate sponsor and the beginning of the NHRA's booming popularity with large budget teams and championships. 1970 also introduced the first Silver Series, which contained three silver-painted models, the Boss Hoss, the Heavy Chevy, and the King Cuda, which were only obtainable through a mail-in offer that included a membership to the Hot Wheels Club. These three cars featured supercharged engines featuring large roots blowers with hoods 
and open exhaust headers. And after the style of drag racing cars of the after the style of drag racing cars of the era. So popular among children, the silver cars were considered faster than the rest of the Hot Wheels lineup because they were supposedly heavier than the other gravity models. But the accuracy of this claim has never been tested under scientific conditions. However, 1972 and 1973 were slow years. Only seven new models were made in 72. And of the 24 models appearing for 73, only three were new. Also, the cars changed from Mattel's in-house Spectra Flame colors to mostly drab, solid enamel colors, which mainstream Hot Wheels cars still use today. And due to low sales and the fact that the majority of the castings were not reused in later years, the 72-73 models are known to be very collectible. In 74, Hot Wheels introduced its flying colors line and added flashy decals and tampo printed paint designs, which helped revitalize sales. As with the lower friction wheels in 1968, this innovation was revolutionary in the industry. And although far less effective in terms of sales impact than in 1968, and was copied by the competition who did not want to be outmaneuvered again by Mattel product strategists. So in 1977, the red line wheel was phased out with the red line no longer being printed on the wheels. This cut costs, but also reflected that the prototypical red line tires popular on high speed rated automotive tires during the era of muscle cars and polyglass tires were no longer popular. During this period, there was a trend away from wild hot rods and fantastic cars and a move to more realistic cars and trucks like the competitor Matchbox. Then in 1981, Hot Ones wheels were introduced, which had gold-painted hubs and claimed to have thinner axles for greater speed, along with additional suspension compliance that older production Hot Wheels lacked. Ultra Hot Wheels were introduced in 1984 and looked something like the cast alloy wheels found on a 1980s-era high-trim Renault Fuego or a Mazda 626 with three parallel dark lines cutting diagonally across the flat chrome face of the wheel, all three broken in the center to form six individual shorter lines. These new Ultra Hots claimed further speed improvements. Hot Wheels started offering models based on 1980s era sports and economy cars like the Pontiac Fiero or Dodge Omni 024, in addition to their typical hot rod and muscle car style offerings. And then in 1983, a new style of wheel called Real Riders was introduced, which featured real rubber tires. And despite the fact that they were very popular, the Real Riders line was short-lived because of high production costs. In the late 80s, the so-called Blue Card Blister Pack color scheme was introduced, which would become the basis of Hot Wheels colors still used today. Original blister packs were red and yellow. Two other innovations were introduced briefly in Hot Wheels cars in the 1980s. Thermal color change paint and rotating crash panel vehicles or crack ups. The former was able to change color on exposure to hot or cold water, and there was an initial release of 20 different cars available as sets of three vehicles. The latter were vehicles with a panel that on contact would rotate to reveal a reverse side that appeared to be heavily dented. Variations in crash panels included front, real, rear, and side panels, the last of whose mechanism has proven to be the most durable. In the 1980s, Hot Wheels had gotten into a controversy with General Motors' Chevrolet Motors division. In 1982, the Chevrolet Corvette had ended the curvaceous Mako Shark body style that had been in production for almost 15 years, and GM announced that the Corvette would be redesigned. Well, in 83, Chevrolet started to produce the all-new C4 Corvette but had assembly line problems, which pushed production back six months, causing GM's marketing department to label all 1983s as 1984s once they got production perfected so it would seem to the public that the all-new C4 Corvette came out early rather than late. But Hot Wheels saw what the new model of Corvette was going to look like before GM's official unveiling, and they designed a die-cast version of the 84 Corvette. 
Well, GM was angered and almost pulled its licensing with Mattel. But this controversy helped Corvette enthusiasts see what the new Corvette was going to look like. The 1984 Corvette production ran for 1.5 model years, covering half of the remaining 1983 model year and ending on time for the 1985 model year. In conjunction with Epic's software, Mattel released a computer game edition of Hot Wheels for various 8-bit platforms in 85 as part of the Computer Activities Toy Series. Well, in 89, Mattel released collector numbers, and each car had its own number. The cards were all blue. For all blister packs released from 89 to 94, numbers included went as high as 274. However, these were skipped, skip numbered, and each and numbers such as 48, 61, and 173 were not used. The year 1995 brought a major change to the Hot Wheels line, where the cars were split up into series. One was the 1995 model series, which included all of that year's new castings. In 1996, the model series was renamed to First Editions. 1995 also saw the introduction of the Treasure Hunt series. The rest of the series included four cars with paint schemes that follow the theme. For example, the Pearl Driver cars are all, all had pearlescent paint. Sales for the series model soared with another program also introduced that year called the Bonus Car Program, causing stores across the nation to have shortages. Purchasing the four-car sets and sending in the packaging backs plus the handling fee gave you the opportunity to collect the bonus cars. One each released for each quarter of the year starting in 1996 through at least 2000. Several new wheel designs were also introduced in the 1990s. And Mattel bought Tyco Toys in 1997. Along with the purchase came the company's old competitor, Matchbox. Arguably, the two dominant companies in Matchbox-sized cars were now under one roof. In 1998, Mattel celebrated the 30th anniversary of the Hot Wheels brand by replicating various cars and individual packaging from its 30-year history and packaging, the, packaging these replicated vehicles in special 30th anniversary boxes. In 1999, Hot Wheels Interactive was launched. We will stop there. And when we pick up on Wednesday's edition, we'll look at the 2000s. We'll start that new decade when we come back on part two of episode 36 of Jay's Retro Toys and Games, where we'll look at Hot Wheels in the 2000s. Well, I tell you, friends, we have had some fun around here looking at and reminiscing about old cars and some great stuff to go along with it. Do subscribe to the YouTube channel. We'll put a link in the bottom there, description of where you can go, and definitely put it out there in the Facebook groups as well. Finding all your important information up and coming in the next couple of weeks. As we get closer to Thanksgiving, we'll be looking at some really good toys and some, some surprises along the way. Something to get you inspired for the Christmas shopping season as Black Friday approaches us here. Let me also point this out, too. Our YouTube channel is getting close to 900 views, and we're very happy about that. We thank you very much for your continued support, and we look forward to seeing you subscribe to our channel to get more updates as well. I'm Jason DiCanio, thanking you for episode 35 tonight on this Monday, November 14, 2022. We'll see you in a couple days for the second part of this great series of Hot Wheels. Have a good night, and remember, be honest, be real, and keep it simple, stupid kiss. We'll see you on Wednesday. Bye for now.
forget to subscribe to the Democratizing Network for great more content like this one.